while we're working. Answer choices that are the exact opposite. Now, why do opposite answer choices make sense when you're constructing a GMAT test? Because you can talk about the exact thing that was being discussed in the passage, but just sort of flip whether it can or cannot, does or doesn't. So one word uh, can, can be changed when the other eight words in the answer choice are actually something that was talked about in the passage. So that's why they like opposite answer choices. And then what I call mixed up answer choices, which is, um, uh, you know, part, <clears throat> let's go back a slide, I'll show you what a mixed up is like. When they take a piece of something here and then combine it with a piece of something from here, where there's just no logical connection between them in the passage, but again, as they're constructing the answer choices, they, and you're just sort of answering off your memory, you'll remember the thing that they talked about here and you'll remember something here and you'll be like, yeah, that's the right answer choice. The, both of those things were, that was in there. So these are the typical wrong answer choices. On passages that, are, that have line references, how do we read those? So if the first pat question we get on a reading comp, uh, on a uh, reading comp passage on the GMAT is a line reference question, I'm not going to read the whole passage to answer that first line reference question. I'm going to do that when I need to. So if I get a line reference question and it's about something that's on line 23, I want to start about five to seven lines before it and continue reading to about five to seven lines after it. A lot of times that ends up turning into the whole paragraph, but the answer is usually quite proximate to the line reference. So last week we looked at main idea and main purpose questions and we said to ID the question we're looking for language like primarily concerned with, main idea, or primary purpose. And we want to eliminate answer choices that are too specific because if an answer choice is referencing of just one very specific thing that the passage pointed out, again, why is that an attractive answer choice? Because your mind is like, oh, that was in there, but that's not answering the question. And that's why we're going back and forth between the passage and the question and the answers to make sure that the answer we're giving isn't just matching with the passage, but is also matching with the answer choice, uh, with the actual question rather. So uh, outside of the scope of the passage and just too big a logical stretch. So today we're going to talk about some other question types, the infer-imply questions. We're going to talk about explicitly stated questions. We're going to talk about logical structure questions, and we're going to work about you know four or five questions on two pretty lengthy passages today to, to, to see all these ex in example. But let's just talk a little bit about how we identify them and how we work with them first. So IDing the question type on infer or imply questions. It's pretty straightforward. We see language like suggests, the passage describes, the passage is inferring, the passage implies. When we see these words, we should be able to think that, okay, we're dealing with an infer or imply question. So how do we work these answer choices? This is what we're looking for. We're looking essentially for a paraphrase. Whoops. We're looking for a paraphrase, which is saying the same thing but in different words. That's the right answer on an infer or imply question. It basically must be true, and I should be able to do what I call, let's see if I get my finger, the, the finger test where I can point my finger to the part of the passage that has that answer. If I can't point to it, then it's probably not the right answer on an infer or imply question. So always check with the passage on these. On questions that are ex but that I call explicitly stated questions, or with these single quotes, explicitly stated questions, uh, we ID the question type and we're looking for language like according to the passage. This is, a, this is a pretty big giveaway when you see the according to the passage or the passage states. And in these, these are sort of like detailed questions. They want you to actually find one specific piece of information in the passage. To work with it, answer choices, again, watch out for extreme language. It could be referencing something similar to something stated in the passage, but just throw a little extreme language in there, and then that's not really appropriate anymore. Look out for answer choices that are the opposite. Again, they could mention something that was stated in the passage, except for the opposite way. And you'll remember most of it because most of the words from the answer choice will match with the words from the passage, 
but they just flip the logic around it. And or mixed up answer choices like we talked about where they take one piece and put it together with another in a way that the passage did not ever do. Again, we should be able to really point to these ones. And then logical structure questions are essentially asking us, how is this passage put together? So uh, they, we, we can ID them, we see words, you know, argumentative language like assumption and undermine and support like we do on critical reasoning. These are sort of like the critical reasoning style questions on reading comprehension, where they're asking us to identify what or how or why or counter arguments. So we want to consult these sort of passage map that we made and reread relevant portions of the passage. There we go. Things are moving all over the place. Here. There we go. So check with the passage. Incorrect choices may contradict the main idea or the tone. So we're going to be looking at main purpose questions. Get rid of anything too specific or outside of the scope. We know how, how to ID those. Infer or imply questions. We know how to ID those. We want to find an answer choice that's essentially a paraphrase. On explicitly stated questions, if they're detailed questions, we should be able to point to them. A lot of what we're going to get out of here is working the wrong answer choices and identifying them. Uh, and then logical structure questions, and then of course we'll do some homework. So let's go ahead and jump into that, and this should be good timing-wise in terms of uh, getting through these questions. Let me just switch. See if I can. Too much. Okay. Okay. So. We, I see the question, always go to the question first. The main purpose of this passage is to, so we have a main idea question. We're going to use our whiteboard here at, like we would our scratch pad to sort of uh, break down the paragraphs. So let's go ahead and do that. Paragraph one. Paragraph one. Just something that's actually faster on the GMAT than it is right here. Uh, during the middle of the... Good, so we have a couple of paragraphs here. So let's go ahead and start and do our first sentence, last sentence of the paragraph, because we should be able to answer this main purpose question in that time. So from here to here, go ahead and do that, and we will read it together. This is rendering a little strangely, don't worry about that, it goes to about here uh, and then the passage ends down here. So I'll start up here and, and, I'll, and I'll get us down to the bottom. So let's just stop at this point. So middle of the 19th century, let's go to our scratch pad, so we should have 19th century, mid 19th century, Youth activism took shape as more people began organizing. So, youth, youth, I can't write today. Holy, holy moly. Let's try that again. P1. So, in the mid 19th century, what did it say? It said that youth activism went up. So, Youth activism went up. Good, that's all I need to get. Let's go down to this part, second half of this paragraph. So here they tell us that the youths separated from adults. then later came back to working with adults in the movement. Great, we've got that paragraph nailed down. The second paragraph starts here and goes to here for the first sentence. OK, 
Okay, so today they're saying, today it's more youth plus adult. Good, so today it's more youth plus adult. And then down here at the bottom, of here to here, So they say, what is it, adults can exploit, and maybe not effective. So I ended up working the passage quite a bit here, which is fine though, we're going to answer more questions on it. We've made a good logical map and structure of the passage. We have the gist of what the passage is talking about, so we've done actually really well there. So the main purpose of this passage is to, let's take a look here, criticize an aspect of American society. That seems a bit extreme to me by showing how young people have historically been denied a voice. So at some points they talk about how they did have a voice and they did rise and criticizing an aspect of American society doesn't seem supported. If you want to hold on to it, let's just hold on to it, see what happens. Argue that young people should become more involved. So this shouldness I don't like because it doesn't seem supported. I don't see that happening. And he doesn't seem to be arguing here. Well, I guess he's making some argument, but uh, he's not saying that they should do this. So I'm going to get rid of be. Explain the youth activism movement. That seemed to happen from its beginnings in labor protests. They did that at the beginning to the importance of today's youth voice. I'm going to hold on to this. It sounds like a little piece of the different parts of the passage. Let's go to D. Show the cause and effects of youth activist involvement in the labor rights movement. So. The labor rights movement just seems to be one specific part of the passage. This is too specific, I think. This is about youth voice. Youth voice, more than just, I think, labor rights movement. And uh, get rid of that one. Contrast how youth and adults participate in the modern social activism. So I don't think they're contrasting here. They don't sort of compare them against one another. They talk about both of them. This is a sort of, you know, mixed up answer choice where again, they do talk about adults and youth, but they're not really contrasting them. So all of the words must make sense. So we're left with C and A. I think he does more explaining than criticizing. Uh, and he definitely, a little piece of each of these things can be found throughout the passage. Uh, and being historically denied a voice in the political arena seems too specific and maybe too extreme. So let's go with uh, C. Great. So we're going to stick with this passage and the work we did on putting together the, uh, the, our own notes on the passage should help us. Uh, and at this point, at least, we have a, the passage a little bit better in our heads. So we see this next question is pretty easy to identify as an infer question. It can be inferred from the passage. So we know that we're looking for a paraphrase. Already we have a sense of what the answer choice is going to look like before we even read the passage. Well, if this was the first question, before we maybe read the passage, and um, certainly before we read the answer choices, we have a sense of what to expect. So it can be inferred from the passage that today's young activists uh, relate to adult activists in which of the following ways. So let's go ahead and I don't know that I can jump to any specific part of the passage that talks just about that. They talk about that throughout the passage. Let's see if we can work the answer choices and at least eliminate a few or uh, help us. Uh, if we're looking for something that we can point to, uh, we should be able to work the answer choices and see if these things are in there. The right answer should be something we can, we can point to. So young activists prefer to remain separate from their adult counterparts. Well, we, if, we, if we look at our 